This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 440. When you are shy, you're making the other person do all the work. Like, I don't really feel like talking to you, so I'm going to sit in the corner quiet, and now they have to go out of their way to be like, oh, what are you doing? What are you interested in? It's the opposite of curiosity. And I've been there so I can say it for myself. It's so self-absorbed that you can't put yourself out there. You did everything right. Got the degree, the knowledge, experience, business plan, the optimized website. So why don't more people want what you have to offer? Why don't more people care about it? Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I interview another successful and inspiring author each week, and we dig into their latest book and their unique insights on things like leadership, productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, entrepreneurship, and a whole lot more. And today we're being joined by my friend Vincent Puglisi. He's author of a book called The Wealth of Connection, A New Approach to Making Business Personal. If Vincent's name sounds familiar, it might be because this is his second appearance on the Read to Lead podcast. He first appeared in episode 223, an episode titled The Key to Your Future Freedom Lies in Freelancing. If you like what you hear from Vincent today, you can find that episode at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 223 for episode 223. Today's episode, readtoleadpodcast.com slash 440 for episode 440. Hey, tell me if you identify with this. You have a decade or more worth of notes in various places from the content you've consumed. Might be on your phone, maybe actual physical notebooks, then notes you have, say, in an app like OneNote. Maybe you've struggled to organize and categorize those notes. You, you kind of think of yourself as a hoarder of things. Or maybe similar to that, you read a lot to stay current for your job. You pass a lot of info on to clients and the folks you work with, and you're looking for a system to better access and organize, say, articles and information that you gather through the books and journals and articles you read online so that you can easily refer to them again, but your system isn't working. Well, if you identify with either one of those scenarios, then you are just the right type of candidate for my note-making mastery cohort which is soon launching in its third iteration. It keeps getting better and better with each new version. That's happening in October. The landing page for that, the sign-up page being built as we speak. But if you want to get on the notifications list so that you're among the first to find out when sign-up is ready and waiting, just go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash list. That's readtoleadpodcast.com slash list. Put your name and your email address in the form, click submit, and you will officially be on the notifications list for our October Note Making Mastery cohort. Now, if you can't do October, that's okay. Go ahead and put your name on the notifications list anyway, and you'll get notified about the next one that comes after that, which will likely be early 20. 20- 23. During the cohort, we walk you through how to better collect and capture the notes from the content you consume, how to organize those notes and connect new ideas with existing ideas in your system, how to contribute to your notes, your own insights and ideas, how to evolve your notes, in other words, and make them useful to future you, who is the one who's going to need them ultimately, right? And finally, how to create with those notes new things, new ideas, new opportunities, new innovations. If that sounds exciting to you, and if you're a geek like me, it probably does, then I hope to see you very, very soon, maybe even in cohort three coming in October. One more time, read to lead podcast.com slash list to get on the notifications list right now. Well, Vincent, I'm excited to have you here. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I know we scheduled this a long time ago. Thanks for your your patience and your generosity. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm excited to be here and to do this again with you. This is cool. Yeah. And I hinted before we started that I had a problem with your book. So I'm just going to kick off with that. I'm, okay. <laughs> for, for those that I have no idea what he's going to come at me with here. So I'm, I'm ready for the ambush. Let's go. <laughs> There's this... Uh, uh, well, let me, let me back up. Vincent was at one time a photographer and among other things, he shot at a lot of sporting events, a lot in Pittsburgh with the Steelers and, and other events. I uh, saw Tom Brady a lot. And you mentioned how you saw him beat up on the Colts and the Steelers and other teams, but next to the Colts, you put in parentheses many, many times. (laughs) And as a Colts fan, I had to, was that really necessary? (laughs) You know, to, to, to add color and context to how often he just beat the Colts. Yeah. I think I had to, I think it couldn't have been like just, 
It was one or two times. It was every <laughs> single time. I flew to Foxborough in January, in September, in Indy, and he always won. And I, Jeff, I was shooting, you know, for an Indiana newspaper a lot of those times. So I wanted the Colts to win. If they won, I would move on. I would get the trip to Miami and then I would go to the Super Bowl. But Tom Brady <laughs> dashed my Super Bowl dreams more than he did to Ben Roethlisberger and Peyton Manning, at uh, least as much, because it would seem like every year yeah. he was ending my playoff season early. Oh, man. We got past him once, and the Colts went on to win a Super Bowl, but but it was that AFC Championship game that w- was really the Super Bowl, if I'm yeah. being honest. Can I, can I tell you a funny story about that that has nothing to do with why we're having this conversation? <laughs> sure. I've been shooting every year, and I've been, you know, when I first got into Evansville, they didn't even photograph pro sports. And I was like, what are you guys doing? You're three hours from, you know, <laughs> Steve McNair in Nashville and Peyton Manning in Indy and Kurt Warner in, in St. Louis. And this yeah. is the hotbed of football right now. So we can cover this. So I went about myself and I got the press passes. So I went and applied for them. I got them, got season passes. They were like, if you can do it, go. <laughs> so I shot the second year, I think 2001, almost every home game of all three teams. Wow. I didn't have kids yet, right? So I was like, there would be a Sunday night in St. Louis, then be a Monday night in in India. I go back and forth all the time. So I did the Super Bowl with the Rams that year. They they lost to the Patriots again. Tom Brady killed another dream. <laughs> um, and playoff after playoff, and then I shot the game where Jerome Bettis fumbled, and they beat the Colts. And I was a Steeler mm. fan, so I really loved that one. But after that season, I said I'm exhausted. Mm. So I said I need a year off. So I said to Jason Clark, who's the photographer, said you want to take over for me? You get the Colts this year. He hadn't shot football very much. Didn't really care that much. Well, guess what happened that year, Jeff? The the Colts decide to go all the way to the Super Bowl and win it. And Jason shot that championship game. And I'll tell you a funny, funny story about it. You know, like, oh, you're so helpful and generous. I can be really spiteful as well (laughs) because they made it to the Super Bowl. And I had all the connections. And I I messaged Pam Humphrey, who was the PR person from the Colts. I think she still is. I said, hey, I need an extra pass for the Super Bowl, which is an impossible question to ask that's like gold and she said Vince you know you've been with us for years and this and that she goes I'm going to give you a second pass I couldn't believe it I come back to my boss my photo editor who will remain nameless and all of a sudden a secret meeting happened and he took my pass and was the second photographer for the Super Bowl and and the funniest part about this is in a spiteful way I told my mom I was really you know I was a lot less mature then right (laughs) it was 17 years ago and I was so like mad about it I told my mother like how upset I was. And she goes, well, I'm going to hope that it rains all night on them. And guess what happened during that Super Bowl, Jeff? <laughs> it rained. <laughs> it rained the entire night. And then when they came back from Miami, Jason walked into the photo desk and he knew that how upset I was by what happened. And he looked at me, he shook his head and he just said, be glad you didn't go. For whatever reason, it was a nightmare of a trip for everybody. And I was like, my spitefulness was vindicated. So that's that's my story from that season. It serves you right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it never rained during a Super Bowl until that Super Bowl. Until that, and, and because there was a, a hex put upon them from our family. <laughs> By Vincent Puglisi and his family. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, the next time I need prayer, I think I'll reach out to your family. Yeah, we, apparently, we, apparently it works. <laughs> you can make it rain. Yeah. <laughs> make it rain. Well, I want to ask you first about the book, about the circumstances that that led you to the realization that this was a part of you mm-hmm. that was going to be a book. Yeah, I, it, there wasn't a plan for this, to be honest with you, because I had written a book, I wrote a book called Freelance to Freedom. And when I was done with it, I was kind of like, I'm done. I, I did it. That was my book. That was the story. And I'm not I'm not a writer, but I wrote the book. It did It did pretty well. Okay, I'm, I'm going to make a comparison here. It's probably going to get me in trouble. But, you know, I was like, I'm done. And 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 there was nothing. There was a lot of pain from, you know, writing a book is for if, if you like, I didn't have any ghostwriters. I wrote it all. I, you know, went through the edits millions of times. It was painful, mm. but but fun, but also very painful. And so when we have, you know, we have three boys. So I'm going to make this comparison. If I get in trouble, I get in trouble. That's life. <laughs> but, you know, Elizabeth would, should we get pregnant? And when any of the boys were were born, she'd be like, I'm done. I'm, it's too much pain, too much hassle. But about two years later, you know, you forget the pain and you hold somebody else's baby and you go, eh, maybe, maybe <laughs> we could have another one. And that's how we wind up with two more. But it was the same thing here. I was like, about two years later, I was like, I don't think I'm done. I think there's another book in here because it was a message that I think wasn't being talked about enough. And there's so much about, I would see it in the business world. Like just so much. And I was a part of it. 
So much just selfish goals. What am I going to accomplish? You know, all these journals that we buy, what are you going to get done? Get up, do your morning <laughs> affirmations and what, you, 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 you. I would just start seeing like, wow, I'm not sure if it's always been this way. I'm not sure if the internet has made it just more expansive, but I'm seeing so much self-involvement and selfishness in the business world, all in the name of building a brand, all this type of stuff. What happened was I started looking at the people that did that and I was not as admiring of them, but I'd see people that really always made me feel good. They always went out of their way to help make connections and they weren't into their big giant goals. Of course, they had their own goals, but it wasn't all about that. They were very helpful people and they're the people that I remembered. They're the people that when I told stories, I talked about them, not the really successful people that had the crazy goals. Mm. And that's kind of where it was born upon. And then that story at the beginning with Seth Godin and the woman that grabbed the microphone, she was like, me first. (laughs) And it was in that moment that I was like, wait a second. There's a woman here in the audience that's struggling to build a business. She's been struggling. She grabbed the microphone and said, I go first, talking about how she's struggling to an author like Seth Godin, who's written written 19 best-selling books. But in that moment, when I raised my hand to ask my question, he lifted my book up and he said, Vincent, tell everybody about your new book. Mm. He didn't need to do that. There was nothing that I could do to help him. I'm Mm. this unknown author. He's done everything. Yet he kept my book under his chair. And when I raised my hand, he went back and got it and lifted it up. I said, that's the difference between success and failure. And it was generosity and selfishness because you could see it so clearly. So that's why the book kind of was created. And that's why it, that story kind of led it off. And some people might say, well, gosh, if I'm going to do that for somebody, then you need to pay me. But to your point in the book, you've talked about that story so many times, you've far exceeded mm-hmm. <laughs> any yeah. payment you might have otherwise made. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of the, the role of it. Like, yeah. so How often do people help us and we don't go out of our way to affirm it? or to give them credit or to post about it. And when people go to me, like, what do I do? Like, I know I need to be on social media. I don't know what to write about. I don't want to do I'm like, who's helped you? Mm. Who's helped you? And they're like, huh. I'm like, have you read an article that really changed your mindset? Did you listen to a podcast? Did you read a book? Talk about that. Because when that author or podcaster sees you, they're going to thank you for what's the number one thing that a podcaster wants? Somebody to talk about their podcast. So you you have this opportunity to not even puff yourself up or not even try to be the authority just to help other people. That at least gets you started, but it builds connection because the amount of times that I've done that for others with no expectation, then they come back and they go, hey, you've always been helpful. Like, hey, I want to help you out. I'm not doing it for that reason, but it's such a great way to connect and it's a great way to get started and to help other people around you. So the book is is in five parts. There's character, there's curiosity, connection, collaboration, and creation. Mm-hmm. And and it's the character trait, this first one I want to talk about that that gets into this idea of generosity. What you're talking about ultimately is is setting generous goals, right? Goals mm-hmm. with other people in mind versus yourself in mind. Exactly. So, and it came back to me. I was like, man, I've, I just realized through my whole photography career, you know, I've been doing that for six years or so, but it was, it was so much based around selfish goals, right? Even the story I just told you before mm. in terms of the Super Bowl, I want to get to the Super Bowl. I want to accomplish these things. And those are fine. There's nothing wrong. We all have them, right? Mm. I want a place on the beach. I have selfish goals. But what happens is we, the mistake we make is we put our selfish goals on top of our generous goals. And when, when I explain it, it's like selfish goals, what, what am I going to get? Generous goals are what are goals that we going to get? How can I come on Jeff Brown's podcast and do the best job I possibly can so his audience is inspired by it and it helps you out, right? Mm-hmm. Helps me out as well. If I do a good job, well, maybe some people that follow you might wind up following me or liking my book. That's a generous goal to me is how do I, how is it a win-win? So, Whenever I craft it in terms of almost anything I do now, how is it a win-win? How do I? How is it good for others as well as me? As opposed to here's what I need to make X amount of money this year. I need this many followers. The ones that struggle and the ones that struggle relationally generally have their selfish goals over their generous goals. Mm. And you've got a Zig Ziglar esque idea or quote that I highlighted in your book. When you say everything we want for ourselves, we need to do for others. First, that feels so counterintuitive, but, mm-hmm. but but explain why that works. Anytime you talk to somebody that's starting out, and I help a lot of beginning business owners start and grow to mm-hmm. create this. And every single time it's kind of like, well, how do I do this? How do I get this going? Mm-hmm. And it goes down to this whole thing. Like, what do you want? Like, I want people to follow me. I want people to talk about me. I want people to hire me. I want people to, you know, share my work, all this type of stuff. Well, are you doing that for other people? 
And generally it was no, because they're so focused on what they need to do. So that's where this all comes down to. We've got a bunch of people running around. I need this. I need that. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. But it's the ones that are helpful that form the connection. And when you're helpful and you form a connection, now it's like, well, I, I like this person. This person, there's an ego boost if Jeff says you should check out Vincent's book. Mm. And I'm like, wow, Jeff, thank you. And even like Gary Vanderchuk, it's not meant this way, but he says, you know, um, what, what's the word that he says? It's like guilt marketing. You don't want to do it for this reason, but you almost feel guilty not helping the person out. That help. I've done that a million times. <laughs> Somebody's done something for me, and I'm like, oh, I, I, ah, I can't take from them. I got to go help them now. You don't do it on purpose, but it's the natural reciprocity of, generosity. Mm. When somebody helps you, you want to be a giver. You don't want to be a taker. So that whole, that that's where that all came from. It's like all the things that you want for yourself, the best thing you could do in the first year is start by doing that for other people. You will develop a reputation. You will develop connections. You will develop trust. And then when you go to do something, those people are much more on your side because if you already introduce yourself into their lives by being helpful, not by being a taker. Well, let's move to uh, curiosity. You make a comment in the book about, and, and I, I, I I agree with the fact that education, school oftentimes, and school gets a bad rap for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Certainly in my life, my school experience was one where when I left school, several things had been educated out of me, I would argue. And, and, and you say that for many, curiosity is one of those things. Without a doubt. And I think that's one of the saddest parts about all this. And I think, so for instance, with, with the book, the character and the curiosity, the way it was built out was that those are foundational pieces. Mm-hmm. Meaning if you have bad character, if not even just selfish goals, but if you're just, you know, the whole idea of like, if you're doing this for manipulative reasons, if you're not an honest person, you can have a lot of charisma and not have character. And mm-hmm. I think people get that mistaken. Like, oh, they're very charismatic. So you trust them. And then you end up getting screwed over by them. And like, what happened? Mm-hmm. Well, it was, it was very charismatic, mm-hmm. but they didn't have character. But in, in my life, 50 years, the people that have solid character and they have solid curiosity, I love those people. I want to have conversations with them. I want to have long conversations with them. I want to connect them to other people. What that does is it builds connection. And we'll go into this more, but you know, once you have solid connection as opposed to bad connection, collaboration's easy. Just what we're doing right now is collaborative, getting on stage together, referring people. And then when you create stuff, you have this whole thing set before you. So that's why character and curiosity are so important because we've all met those people that you get into a conversation with and you ask questions and they answer your question, but they never ask a question back. <laughs> and, and, and I have almost, it's almost like I've, I've gotten into this mode where it's like, I'm very curious. So I'll ask questions and this and that. And then I realize maybe 25 minutes in or 20 minutes in, they haven't asked a single question. Not that I need them to, but I'm like, this is a really bad sign. So what I'll do is I'll, at one point I'll just stop. And what happens is it's like, I don't know if anybody's experienced There's like this 10 seconds of awkward silence <laughs> because they're so used to just talking about themselves that when I stop, they do this, it's silence. Mm. And then they'll think, and then they go, so what are you up to? <laughs> it never crossed their mind to even ask that because they were just talking about themselves. But mm. when you cut it off like that, they almost have to reevaluate themselves. Mm. So the people that are curious, the people that ask questions, they're interested in what you're doing. They're interested in what even you talk about the business sense, what their clients are doing, what their potential clients are doing. That's how you solve problems. Mm. That's how you think to figure things out to, to when they find you, they go, how did he know what I was thinking without even talking to me? That comes from curiosity. And that's how the, the the best ones do it. So you open doors for other people, you show interest in other people, and and you build trust that way. So curiosity to me, you know, not everybody has it. I didn't have character when I was younger, but I definitely had curiosity. So that was definitely a strong point. But when you can put those two together, your wealth of connection going forward is going to be so strong. You you say you were shy as a kid. When you look back on your childhood as a shy kid, how do you view that shyness now? I view it the way I wrote it, that it's selfish. Mm. Like I wrote it and, and it kind of ruffles some fe- feathers. I'm like, shy, being shy is being selfish. People like, no, you don't understand. You know, that's just who I am. And I, and I get it with some things, but you, have, you also have to understand when, when you are shy, you're making the other person do all the work. Like, I don't really feel like talking to you, so I'm going to sit in the corner quiet. And now they have to go out of their way. Like, oh, what are you doing? What are you interested in? It's the opposite of curiosity. And I've been there so I can say it for myself. It's so self-absorbed. You're concerned with how other people are going to view you that you can't put yourself out there. And what I've noticed also with experts, we go the other way. Mm. I've noticed a lot of, even in our industry that are experts in their field and they're not curious. And I think of a couple of people in particular, and I remember saying like, 
man, they've got such a great following and, and everything. But when I meet with them, I'm so not intrigued when I talk to them. They're not mm. curious. They don't ask any questions. And a, and a response I was given that was very interesting is because they are the authority, they don't want to be curious because if they ask questions, it shows that they're not an expert and they always want to remain to look like the expert. And I was like, wow, that's, and I started seeing that more and more. So to me, I don't have to be the expert. The whole idea is like, don't worry about having the answers, worry about having the questions. And that's the way that I like to live with it. And you say too, in the book, and to, to your point, that there isn't anyone on the planet likely that we can't learn something from. Totally. And, and in any way, right? I, I learn from my kids all the time. Like, oh, I'm the parent. You will listen. Like, yeah, of course, we have a structure in this household. But my kids mm-hmm. teach me something all the time. You know, 11-year-old, 14-year-old, 17-year-old. If, if I feel like I always have the answers and they have to they have to learn from me, but I don't learn from them, I'm never growing with that. People say, oh, never take the advice from somebody who's not been where you're at, where you want to go to. I think it's terrible advice. I'm always learning from people because they can add value in a different way than what is, is I'm looking towards. Even the older person who's not doing it anymore, mm. they've been there, they could add, add value to it. So that's the whole idea of always remaining curious. It's a struggle for some. Um, it was a struggle for me at times, but I think it's, it's such a valuable part of this. Mm. Now let's turn to uh, the third one, connection. Uh, you say networking and connection should be thought of very, very differently. Why is that? I'm not a fan of the word networking. <laughs> because net- networking to me is going to a conference, having your business cards, handing it out. Hey, here's my elevator pitch. I've never worked on an elevator pitch. I've never worked on a 30 second spiel. Mm. I'm not trying to win you over quickly so you can buy something from me. <laughs> um, I'm an extroverted introvert where I don't re- personally, I don't really like small talk. I don't like elevator chat. I like deep conversations. And it's like, so we can get right into it right away mm. as opposed to oh, how's the weather, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the whole idea of, of connection, it, it really comes down to, the conversation that you're having, the, the trust that you're building from the curiosity and the character you're making to really develop what I want is long-term relationships so that three years from now, I can connect with you where I can bring you to other people, where I can connect you together, as opposed to networking where I'm trying to make a sale on something. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's something where I don't, I think it's sometimes people are like, well, I'm not a good networker. I'm not a good networker either, mm-hmm. but I want to be a good connector. I think there's a big difference between the two. Mm. Share a bit about your feeling of the need to learn the skill of reading the room. Oh, this is a, this is a big one. This is a really big one because I had this conversation this weekend and I, <laughs> and I have it all as a younger person and they're telling me their, their vision and their dream. There was l- literally no reading of the room at all. Talking endlessly, not noticing people's eyes glazing over, not looking for, you know, wait a second, is this person even interested in what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk till I'm blue in the face, but even though they're looking around the room and they're kind of even almost acknowledging other things going on, there's no, there's not a point where they stop and say, am I just talking just to talk without any interest? And I noticed this years ago, I was, I was telling a story. I was doing exactly what this person is doing. And somebody had to be interrupted for a moment. I said, hold on one second. They turned away and then they came right back and like, it was good talking to you. And they left. And I was like, I'm not done with the story yet. I was kind of like insulted. I'm like, and then I realized, my goodness, I was just rambling on and mm-hmm. they weren't, was, was I involved in the conversation? So to be able to read the room, to be able to see when people are leaning into what you're saying, or they're getting bored where you got to stop and be like, oh, am I even talking about what they're interested in? Looking around, seeing that to me has been vital because even running mastermind calls mm. and the content you create, when you can see like eyes widen when you say something, when you see heads nodding collectively, that's reading the room to go, this content is strong. So mm. it's not just even in terms of connection. I can see, oh, wait, this is something that I can bring each time I come back because I'm reading the room as opposed to just telling the story. So I think often if we could do this in our connections, where we can see if they're interested, we can see, hey, let me ask them a question instead of rambling on. I think it's a vital part that people miss because they're so, and I think, Jeff, I think it's worse now than ever with COVID. When you go to conferences, I'm noticing more than ever people that are not reading the room in a way that that could actually benefit them going forward. Mm. How has collaboration manifested itself in your life and business? Maybe some examples of how putting an emphasis on that has, has, has benefited you and others. Oh, it's collaboration. It's funny because like collaboration is the thing that really starts to explode it all. Mm. Because once you have the, if you could build those solid foundations, if you build great connections, you think about even in terms of the world of affiliates, affiliates is all collaboration, Mm. right? It's all working with somebody else in your field to level each other up. And I think about for me, for example, when I first started, I was in a, in a mastermind and I had an idea 
you know, I was, I was still a sports photographer. I was not even in the world that I'm in right now in terms of any type of coaching or community. And there was a guy named Carl Schultz at this mastermind that I was at. And he built a thing called Schultz Photo School. It was a $10 a month membership. And it was teaching, like not even photographers, but teaching parents how to take better pictures of their kids. And I'm listening to him give his presentation of what he does. And I'm like, that's pretty fascinating because I've never done anything like that. And I'm like, mm. wow, it's the first foray into recurring income and things that I always got paid when I worked. Mm. But he's getting a recurring income from a thousand people. So I'm listening. I'm fascinated. And I'm thinking about what I do. And I'm like, wait, I could probably add value to this guy. So he comes back and I go up and I give my presentation. And it's about my career as a sports photographer. And all this types and all these stories. And I come back and he's sitting behind me and I looked at him and I said, I've got an idea. And he looked at me and he said, yes. <laughs> and I said, you don't even know what I'm going to say. He goes, go ahead. And now we got about three or four people leaning and listening to the whole thing. So he said, go, go ahead and tell me. And I said, we should collaborate. And I use those words. We should collaborate and we should do a sports course for parents how to teach parents how to take better sports pictures of their kids. Cause there's all these parents out there on the sidelines of these games mm. and they don't know how to take it. And, and these moments go away quickly. Your seven-year-old doesn't look like a seven-year-old very long, right? <laughs> all of a sudden they're going to be taller than those moments are gone. And he was like, that's exactly what I was thinking. So I said, okay. So we went back and we met in St. Louis and we drew it all out and we created a course. I knew nothing about creating a course. He knew nothing about shooting pro sports, but a collaboration he comes in, he goes, here's the framework we need. You know, here's the way we record it. And I'm sitting here learning all this stuff, right? And then I'm teaching these stories. Like, here's what we could teach here. Like, on down the line, he goes, I wouldn't even thought about that, right? Mm. It's a peanut butter cup. Here's a peanut butter cup. It's peanut butter and chocolate. They're both <laughs> kind of okay. But when you put them together, it's the best-selling Halloween candy ever. Yeah. So that's exactly what we did. So we created that. We recorded it. I learned a lot. We put it out there with his list. We made, I think it was $32,000 in the first day. It was over 50 grand the first week. And that's a collaboration. If I, Jeff, if I tried to do it on my own, it would have gone nowhere. If he would have tried to do it, it would have been okay, but he wouldn't have had the experience and the stories and the pictures that I got to show. Mm. And it was a perfect collaboration. So since that moment, I'm like, how do we collaborate? How do we take our skills, mesh it with somebody who has something a little different that we can work together on and then expand both of our universes? I can't remember who introduced us now, but I've had coffee with Kyle at uh, the Frothy Monkey in Franklin, Tennessee. Is that right? A couple of years back. Yeah. Great guy. Great guy. Yeah. Great guy. Well, that leads us to the last one, the last uh, part of your book called Creation. Um, I'll ask a similar question. How, how does that manifest itself in, in your life and business? What do you mean when you say creation? Well, cre it's, it's what you create. It's, it's your podcast. It's your book. It's your business. It's whatever it is that you're creating. And it's interesting because like, as I'm writing the book, I know this needs to be in there, but I'm like, where does it go in there? Mm. Because a lot of times it's always like, hey, here's how to create an idea, right? Here's how to build your business. And the whole idea is, wow, I'm putting creation at the end. I'm not putting it at the beginning because how many times people create something. I'm sure you've seen this in your world a million times. They spend three years writing a book. They don't tell anybody about it. Mm. They lock themselves in a cabin and they write and they, and they keep perfecting it. It's not ready yet. And the first part needs to be better. The last part needs to be better. All this stuff. Have you told anybody? No, because it's got to be perfect. Have you shared it with anybody? No, it's got to be perfect. So then they come out and then they put it out. And nobody cares. Nobody cares because there's no, there's been no connection. You've not kept in touch with people. You've not shared it with people. You've not collaborated on, hey, how can I make this better? What do you think about this book? Could this be a little better? What can I add? That's where collaboration comes into creation. And so many people do this in private. They build mm -hmm. their creation in private and they think that people care. And the truth is, you know, we all know you buy because you know, like, and trust people, all right. not because you generally wrote a great book. So they create this thing and they put it out and they get crickets and they're disappointed. And then two months later, they have four reviews on Amazon and they're mad because their mother didn't even buy it. <laughs> and then they stop. They don't write again or they don't do their podcast. You know, they quit business. And the reason, the whole idea of creation and, and I walk through it in the book, people do it backwards. But if you do it this way, which I try to teach is Build your character. It, it's a huge point. And you do it continuously. Your curiosity in your work and in other people's work. You take the time daily and weekly to build and strengthen connections. You do, you, you do all the stuff we talk about. You, I talk about the hour of giving where you're, you're going out of your way 
to connect people, to reach out to people. You then collaborate with these people, whether it's joining their program or going to a conference, all these types of things. And then when you create something, you have all these people behind you. They trust you. They've been around you. And not only do they want to help you, they want to share it. And then with each bit of success, more success comes. So that's why creation came at the end, because I think this is foundational. And I think it's the reason why people write great books, do great podcasts, but people, but nothing happens from it because they haven't built these foundational parts first. You know, it's so interesting that you say that. I I developed a a new course recently called Note Making Mastery, and I've walked two groups of people through it so far. We're doing a third one uh, coming up in the not too distant future. And the last segment of that teaching is about creation, about taking the notes you've, you've accumulated, you've collected, you've organized, you've distilled, and creating with those notes. But throughout the process, we talk about the importance of getting feedback every step of the way and not creating in a vacuum, and then using that feedback as additional uh, building blocks from which to create. That feedback can be another building block, another piece of the puzzle, but it's a piece of the puzzle you'll never have if you're not sharing little bits and pieces along the way rather than the thing once it's finished. 100%. And putting it out when you're scared to do it. Like I tell the story in the book about, you know, as a photographer, I'm, I'm meeting with Joe Elbert, who's the, at that point, he was the director of photography for the Washington Post, you know, not to get political in any way, but it was the greatest photo newspaper in the, in the late 90s. It, it was bar none, the place to go. He's the guy. And I bring my portfolio that I sweated over and slaved over for three years. And I hand it to him and he's a tough editor. I've seen it. And he goes through my portfolio and he pulls two pictures out. And I go, okay, I got 18 out of 20 of your good pictures. And he slides those two pictures over and he says, those two, that's your portfolio. Get rid of the rest. Not the 18, it's the two. (laughs) Yes. But he he said to me, those two will stand the test of time. I would publish those in any of my publications. And I walked away and I was crushed at first. I'm like, oh my God, all that work doesn't understand how hard I work. Nobody cares. Mm. Nobody cared about how hard I worked. They cared about the impact. If I had to explain the picture to you, it's not good enough. But then when I sat on the couch, I realized that was really important. He basically gave me the feedback that I needed to elevate myself. So instead of keeping 18 mediocre pictures, I got rid of all of them. And I literally sat there with a plastic thing of two slides with 18 empty. And I said, my job now is to create 18 more images that can match this in quality. That leveled up my photography like nothing else did. Mm. But if I would have done like some other people and ran away from it, I'd still be kind of hanging around in mediocrity, thinking I'm doing okay because I thought I was doing okay. But when you get feedback, like you said, from the people that really know, mm. it, it speeds up the game. Mm. And you have to have thick skin to do it. You have to be able to take criticism or whatever. See, I like to call it feedback than criticism because <laughs> it's feedback for what you're doing. And so I think that's such a, like you mentioned, that's such a vital part. And how many people in that specific scenario you just described passed up on the opportunity to get that feedback because of fear of what he would say, because of fear of totally. that he might tear apart their portfolio. And and you sucked it up and did that. Yeah. yeah, I watched a couple walk away and never get it. But driving back from there to Athens where I went to school, it's like, okay, I knew I needed to step up my game more. Mm. But without that, I wouldn't have known that. That's why like constantly looking for feedback, constantly looking for accountability and to get better with it is, and, but that only comes from people that trust you, right? Mm. Or that you trust. Anybody can message me and go, your book sucks, right? <laughs> but Jeff, if you told me, listen, this, this really could be improved upon, you know, mm. I'm going to listen to you then just so, rather than somebody just maybe that's just angry or, <laughs> right. or, or I made them angry 20 years ago and they want to you know, say something mean. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm trusting somebody because of their expertise and because of the connection. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where it's like, we have to seek that out. I want to ask you uh, one or two questions in the time we have left, Vincent, and that yeah. aren't uh, directly connected to the book. Before I do that though, anything else you want us to know about the book? No, I think it's, I, I hopefully this is, this resonates in terms of, you know, the value of the relationships in our lives, the connections in our lives, not just, not just for the business side of it, which is important, but just for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Like I, feel like a different person concentrating more on others than it was all just about me. And, and if that can, if that can resonate, then I hope you pick it up. One thing I want, did want to touch on about that. What do you say to someone who says, I've heard the phrase like show up filled up or, you know, the, 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 the scenario that everyone always cites, you know, the flight attendant who says you got to put your own mask on before, you know, you can help anybody else. Um, what would you say to somebody who argues back, but well, wait a minute, when, you know, when the morning starts, I need to pour into me first before I'm of value to anyone else. I think there's truth to all of it. I don't, I don't think there's an incorrect statement to say that. Mm-hmm. I just, 
I don't I don't think it's that you don't you don't breathe yourself before you you know I wake up and I breathe. I don't hold my breath before I go help somebody, right? <laughs> I don't do that. But I think there comes a point where you can maybe try to hog more oxygen. Mm. Where you kind of go, yeah, I'm breathing. I want more. It yeah. Feels really good. Let me give oh me. You know, I, I, it's, it's not survival. We all need survival and survival is about, Hey, you got to keep your lights on. This is not, you can't go giving tons of money away while your kids are not eating. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking, I, I guess maybe that could be a good even explanation of like, this is beyond survival. You, when you wake up, you're doing okay. And it's like, okay, how am I going to grow? How am I going to, cause we can stay in that spot, but I, I would never say, Hey, don't put, don't put the oxygen, oxygen mask on yourself first. I would never say that. Well, over the course of your career, you've read your share of books and recommended them to others, I'm sure, uh, your mastermind groups and people who listen to your podcast. What are some that come to mind? If I, if I were to pin you against a wall and say, give me, <laughs> give me two books that everybody has to read, what are the first two that come to mind? There's literally a book right now that I'm reading. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go by current. Mm-hmm. Mode. And, and, and our pastor, our church talked about this and it's called The Search for Significance. I'm not sure if you've read this book. I have not, but I, I've certainly heard of it. Yeah. But it's going along with, with a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of why are we doing this and, and, and just the things that hold us back, the imposter syndrome, the, 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 the beliefs that we have, the doubts that we have in ourselves to go forward, but then to, to be more helpful and collaborative mm-hmm. and to do exactly what we're talking about. So that book, I'm in the middle of it right now. Another book, it's, a, it's an old one, but I really think, and Jeff, you know, I could probably list off a hundred books right now. So I have a hard time because it's like, which one do I choose? <laughs> but one that I've been recommending again lately, just the people that are like me that are ADHD brains, mm-hmm. right? I, I've learned that. I was never diagnosed, but I'm, I'm a total big idea person, but not a detail person. Mm-hmm. And I'm all over the place. And I know that I can go in tangents if I don't keep myself you know, consistent. Mm. Um, the compound effect by Darren Hardy. I'm constantly referring that out to people like me mm. because people like me are all or nothing. If it's not going great, I'm done with this. I'm going to go do the next thing. Right. right? So you have these fits and starts. Of, I'm going to go crazy. I'm excited about this project. Two months later, oh, I fr- what was that project? I'm doing the next thing. Yeah. Right. It's the next exciting thing. So the compound effect for me is something that I probably have to read two or three times a year to keep me balanced because with with my type of personality and people like mine, consistency is key. You don't need more ideas. We're going to come up with a million ideas. You don't need ideas. What you need is consistency on the ideas that you have to bring it to fruition. So that that's another one that I that I talk about often. Mm. And to your book's point again, many of our best ideas can come from conversations. Right? It's not always us sitting down and brainstorming in an isolated situation, it's it's connecting as you have, have addressed and taking these conversations to new levels so that ideas are generated from them. Without a doubt. And I think that's lost sometimes when people get really caught up in in their schedule and their and their tasks. Mm-hmm. The gr- the best content that I've probably written or recorded started with the conversation. It started with just talking and then them saying something too came from last night in the conversation. I'm like, oh my God, that's that's a blog post. Mm-hmm. So I'm always thinking that way. Like how can I take this conversation because it because it's not just made up. This is real situations. So even mm. with coaches, beginning coaches, I'm like, coach for free. And and a lot of business people will say, don't do that. Never always get your worth. I'm like, no, when you're not in demand, there's two things you can get from doing that for free is you get ideas for content, which you get to flesh out and get better at, which will turn into a blog post, which will turn to social media, which will turn to a book. You also get testimonials. Because if you did a good job, they're going to say, hey, say, hey, did I help you? So it's never really for free, right. but it's a great start. But if you can create content that gets people kind of thinking, hey, can you help me with this? Yeah, it's X amount of money. Now you go from free to paid. And as the demand grows, it grows. But that's a great way to start. But as you said, all of those things almost always for me don't come from my own mind. They come from conversations with others that grow out from there. It's interesting, as I read your book, how much of what you talk about aligns with the course that I'm teaching. And I talk a lot too about how most of our best ideas come from the sources we consume, the conversations that we have. Uh, there are you know, no new ideas <laughs> are, are to be created. It's going to be a combination of the things other people have already done that you put your own unique stamp on. It's really going to make a difference, I guess. 100%. Like the way you describe it, it's almost like a, like a recipe right? Yeah. There's this great chocolate chip cookie. I'm not reinventing the chocolate chip cookie, but 
through conversations and through testing, if I can add, you know, some other ingredient that makes it, oh, this is different. It's a cookie. It's a chocolate chip cookie, but it's my, now it's my own recipe that came out a different way. Yeah. That's how innovation happens. It's not reinventing everything, but like you just said, like you're, you're adding a little bit to put your own spinning, your own stamp on it. Mm. Final question has to do with this whole area of personal knowledge management and, and note taking. And I'd love to get some of your tips or tricks. As I read your book, one of the things I noticed that you are very, very adept at that I think so many people struggle with is you call upon in your book, story after story after story, from, you know, going back from your childhood at age, I think as far back as maybe seven or, or younger. Mm -hmm. And you, you recall them oftentimes with such detail. Uh, and they're stories that really draw you into the book so that when the lesson comes, it's like it hits you, you know, the way it it, it needs to hit you in such mm -hmm. a way that you're going to learn from it and do something with it. Thank so, you. so very well structured. And uh, I just loved how you weave story. And that that is something that so many creators struggle to do. And a lot of times it's because they're, they're not good uh, note takers. They're not good note organizers. They're not good at distilling ideas and thoughts and new insights from the things they consume. I'm just curious to know if you have any particular tips or tricks as to how you manage those things. And, and, I, and I thought to ask you that question, especially because you did such a good job of you know, bringing these stories to life, that some of which are you know, decades old. Well, thank you. First of all, appreciate that. Second of all, it sounds like it's really valuable, the course that you're creating, because I think this is an overlooked aspect of doing this. Mm, right? mm. And so I think, what, I think what you're doing is really valuable. For me, it's actually very simple. I'm kind of a simple guy. <laughs> I have a notes document on my phone. Mm -hmm. And you know, be careful hanging around me because you're going to wind up in the notes document. <laughs> good or bad. And, and here's my policy on that. If you do something good, I name you. If I, if you do something bad, I tell the story, but I don't name you. Sure. And sure. So that, that's how it works. So he, my, my thing is it's very simple. If you scroll through my notes, you'd laugh because it's usually no more than five words. Hmm. But what I do is I get the title of what the idea is about. Now I will go back and when I want to write, I will then pick the one that's freshest to me. But, it, but there's two things that have to come together. It has to have the title. It has to have a story that I know I can tell mm -hmm. in a good story form. And it has to have the lesson. So a lot of times people will say to me, you should do a story about that time we did it. I'm like, well, what's the lesson? Like, I don't know. I'm like, no. <laughs> so it's almost like the highlighter. Remember when we were kids, it was like the highlighter where they had all these little mazes and stuff. Mm -hmm. like, and how do you match this with this? So to me, it's matching story with lesson. So as I'm doing it, sometimes I'll write down the lesson. Sometimes I'll write down the story. But when I can say, oh my goodness, that story leads right into that lesson. Now I can go full bore on telling the story, weaving the lesson in. Mm. And then when I tell the lesson, like you just said, like, oh, I thought I was being entertained, <laughs> but now I got a lesson from it. Mm. My whole goal is to disguise the lesson in the story. Mm. I want you to be like the funsy story. I want you to be so wrapped up in the story that you you come out of it. Well, that was great. Holy crap. Three questions that guy asked and he got what he wanted. I probably should ask more questions. I should probably be more curious as opposed to me saying to you, you should be more curious, right? I don't want you to lecture me, but if you can entertain. So to me, story is the, the quintessential part of it. I'll be honest with you. It's easier to come up with the lesson than the story because if you just scroll any type of have a business leadership world, you're going to see less. But I'll tell you, Jeff, you want to bore me to tears? Give me the seven steps how I could do it. You can, <laughs> here's seven steps to making income. Blah, blah, blah. You, you can do this. You can have yeah. a blog. Like a Bore me to tears. <laughs> but if you can tell the story of what the struggle was and then how you got through it and then wait, you creating that blog is how you got through all these people. Now you've convinced me maybe I should start writing my blog again. Mm -hmm. But just give it in list form. Maybe it's just my mind. I, it bores me to tears. So that's why it's like if I can, as I said, story lesson. Put those together, bake them together, and it's a pretty simple formula. Well, this has been a lot of fun. A great conversation as I knew it would be, Vincent. Thank you so much. The book, again, is called The Wealth of Connection, A New Approach to Making Business Personal. His name is Vincent Paglisi, and he's someone you need to follow and look up. And I'll make that easy to do on the show notes page for this episode. Vincent, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Just a moment ago, Vincent referenced someone named Funzy. It's a real-life character from one of the most fascinating stories from his book. I actually asked him to share that story, and I'm tagging that on the end of today's episode. So if you want to hear the rest of that story when today's episode ends, don't hit stop. 
Don't hit skip. Don't hit pause. Allow it to continue to play, and it'll roll right into that story. One of my favorites from Vincent's new book. If you'd like to connect with Vincent, dig further into this episode, and maybe pick up his book or one or more of the books he recommended, just go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash 440 for episode 440. That's the show notes page, especially for this episode. One more time, that's readtoleadpodcast.com slash 440. There's also a link there where you can put your name on the notifications list for my next Note Making Mastery cohort. If you struggle with taking notes or collecting notes or organizing notes or distilling down your notes or creating with the notes that you collect, this cohort is for you. Readtoleadpodcast.com slash 440 has everything you need. Hey, thanks so much for checking out the podcast this week. I appreciate it so very much. I know Vincent does as well. That's it for this week. Hope to see you next time. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. You opened the door, so I'm going to ask if you're willing. Uh, in, the, in the curiosity section, you tell a story that features a character by the name of Funzy. Yeah. Uh, you mind sharing a bit about that? I just thought it was was fascinating. I, I've told this story since I was 14 or 15. <laughs> and, it, and the funny thing, it, it was always told in a just a humorous way. And it was a tr- total true story. But from the moment that it happened, my dad and my brother and my cousins would say, tell that story. So I'd be sitting there at 16 years old to a table full of like 30 Italian relatives or friends at a party. And I, so I kind of got used to telling the story. Um, but sure. I was a, I was a huge, I still am not, not like I was, but a huge Mets fan, New York Mets fan, mm. long suffering. Um, never won. When, when, when I grew up liking baseball, I became a Mets fan, but the Yankees with Reggie Jackson were winning all these World Series. Why I chose the Mets, I I think I just like pain. Um, <laughs> so I chose them, and they did horribly until I was 14. In 1986, there was like the best year ever. They were the dominant team in baseball. I watched or listened to every game on the on the radio or television, went to a handful of games. It was heaven for me to sit in that stadium, Shea Stadium. Mm. And then they go to play in the World Series versus the Boston Red Sox. Sorry, Red Sox fans, but that's the whole Bill Buckner going the ball go through his legs World Series. Mm. That's when the World Series as a 14 year old, it was it was glory. Like that was like it. Mm. So they had this parade in New York City and I want to go and my mom won't let me go. And I'm like, none of my friends cared. This is when I knew I was into this. Like none of my friends even cared. I was just so into it. Mm. And so I want to go to this parade, you know, October. And late October, my mom's like, no, you're not going to New York City with a bunch of crazy people by yourself. Like, <laughs> to me, that wasn't unreasonable. <laughs> For her, it was. Um, so I didn't go. We watched it on TV that night, the highlights. My mom's like, look how cold everybody looks. Aren't you glad you didn't go? And I was just, I wouldn't even speak to my mom. I was like, mm-hmm. I don't care how cold it was. I wanted to be there. So six months later, it's opening day. And it's the last, and it's the last connection to that team. After opening day, and they give the world series rings out and, the, and they raise the banner. It's on to a new season. That season's over. So I'm like, I have to go. Mm. But I try to convince my parents to let me go. They won't let me go by myself again. Nothing changed in six months. And then finally I bugged them enough that my mom said, well, if you go with a friend, you can go. It was a day game. So I'd have to leave school. Mm. I hated school anyway. So I was more than happy to go. To <laughs> so I convinced my friend Scott to go with me. And then the day of the game comes, my parents leave for work. I'm home alone for like an hour. And it's like freedom. <laughs> my first sign that freedom was going to be a big part of my life. Like I had the house to myself and now I'm going to go to Scott's house and we're going to go to the game. We're going to take the bus to go to the train, to go to the game. Well, I go to his house and he's not allowed to go. His mom changed her mind. So it's like nine o'clock in the morning the games at one. And I stood on my front lawn. I'm like, what do I do? And I, I'd heard the phrase. It's better to ask forgiveness than permission before I'd heard that phrase, before, but I never had a chance to use it. <laughs> so I looked at my house and then I, I'm like, I can walk to school. I can stay home and watch television or I can go to the game. So I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the game. And I had like $30 with me. So I get on the bus and there's, you know, I take the one bus and I have to go one bus to another bus, then to a train, a subway train to get to, to Shea stadium. First bus, nothing happens. Second bus I get on. It's just me and the bus driver and this big, just scary looking Italian guy. 
you know, he looked the part. He looked like out, out of Goodfellas or Sopranos, exactly the part. Talking to the bus driver, cigar in his hand, like laughing loud. I'm like, this guy's scary. I'm going to the back. So I go to the back of the bus. And he looks at me a, five minute, a few minutes into the bus trip, and he says, hey, kid. He goes, shouldn't you be in school? And I'll with a much more Italian accent. And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to the Mets game. I'm all meek and quiet. And he says, by yourself, you're going? He goes, you even have a ticket? And so now he's like turned towards me, like facing right at me. And I'm like, no, you know, I'm going by myself, but I don't have a ticket. I'm going to get a ticket when I get there. Very nonchalant. Mm. And he laughs at me and he points to the bus driver. He goes, you believe this kid? He goes, he goes, this is the hottest ticket in town. It's been sold out for months. You're not getting a ticket. He goes, how much money you got? So he's asking me how much money I got. I'm like, is he going to rob me? Like what? <laughs> so I go, I got $30. And he just laughs out loud. He goes, you're never getting, whatever. He kind of waved me off, like, forget you. So I'm like, thank God he stops asking me questions. So I go to get off the bus and I'm, I'm walking down the steps of the bus. And he says, hey, kid. He goes, come here. He points the finger, turns like this, come here. I turn around and he takes this deep sigh and he goes, all right, when you get the Shea, you go to gate B. He's asked for Vito Laterulli. He goes, tell him Funzie from the waterfront sent you. And I'm like, I'm silent. And he goes, you got it? I'm like, yeah, I got it. He goes, okay, go. <laughs> like, now go. <laughs> like, I leave the bus, I go to the subway and I'm like, there's no way I'm doing this, right? I don't know who this guy is. But Jeff, like on the drive on the subway, <clears throat> I couldn't stop saying his name. I'm like Vito, Funzie, Gabe. I didn't want to forget it, <laughs> just in case. So I get to Shea State, and I still remember getting off the train and seeing just nothing but people, you know, tons of people, all wearing blue and orange. And there's nobody selling tickets. Nobody. Mm. Everybody's looking to buy. There's no way I'm getting a ticket. Not even for, not for thirty bucks at least. So I'm like, I can either get back on the train and go back home. Or I can go to gate B because otherwise I'm not going to the game. So I walk over to gate B and this is kind of like, I think even where my whole life shapes out, like just give it a shot, just give it a chance. Mm. So I walk to gate B and there's an old guy there by the gate. And I say, Hey, is, uh, is Vito here? Vito let really, he goes, who's asking and another old guy screaming at me. Who's asking? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, Funzy from the waterfront. So I mean, I point to like nobody behind me. He's not behind me, but I'm pointing to him. And he literally just, Take, I looked, I'm so nervous that he has his hands on the gate and he opens the gate and he goes, come on in. And I'm like, all right. So I walk in, I'm like, am I in trouble? Did I do something wrong? I'm like, well, why would he let me in if I was in trouble? He would just tell me to leave. He gets in the radio. He goes, wait right here. Two minutes later, this really nice lady comes down, dark hair, has a clipboard. And she goes, come with me, sweetie. And I'm like, okay. So we start walking up the tunnel. We're in the stadium. Now we're in the stadium. And I'm like, what's going on? She goes, are you hungry? And I'm like, Sure. And she goes over and gets me a hot dog and, and popcorn and, and soda. She goes, you want a program? I said, sure. She goes over and gets me a program. <laughs> so, so now we're walking across the concourse. Fans are going to my left and right. We're walking straight. I could see the field now. Mm. I'm like, oh my God, there's the field. And I'm like, just giddy. So I'm walking down the steps. Now we're in the load section right behind home plate. We get to the bottom, right? I mean, literally right close to home plate. Pulls, out a, pulls down a seat. She goes, have a great time. And I sat there and about a half an hour later, the Mets come out and they get their world series rings. I could, I'm so close. I could see the diamonds, like listening out the sun. Like they raise the world series banner. Daryl strawberry hits the three run home my favorite player in the first inning. Best day of my childhood. <laughs> and I take the train home that night and I'm looking for Fundy, and he's not there. I want to tell him what happened. Maybe he's on the bus. I get home to my, my home and my, and my parents don't have no, they have no idea what's going on because there's no cell phones. I couldn't tell them. I'm out all on my own. So I start telling them the story, and they're just completely just baffled by it. And I tell them about Funzi and Vito, and my dad's mouth opens up because my dad knows more than I do. <laughs> and eventually, he's, you know, he said, what were, their, what were their names? I said, Funzi and Vito. And I said, he said, where are they from? I said, the waterfront. I didn't know what the waterfront meant. Most people don't. And, and my dad's mouth just dropped. He looked at my mom. And at that moment, I realized I got to go tell Scott what happened because Scott couldn't go to the game. So I go running the Scott test and I tell him everything. I show him the program is screaming at his mother because he couldn't go. <laughs> and then I run back home and I hear my parents whispering. They didn't hear me come in. And I hear, and now I found out what happened. And I hear my dad say, he's got no idea that the mafia got him into that game. <laughs> and it really ruined me for school. Cause I'm like, there's a whole world going on out there that I don't know about that. I want to be a part of, but 
So I told that story. I, I was a long story, but I told that story for like 10, 15 years before I realized it was a bigger thing than, than what I thought. It wasn't, this enter, it wasn't just this entertaining story. Funzi opened a door for me that I never would have gotten on my own. And he didn't do it by pounding his chest or by saying how great he was or all the steps I've ever told. It wasn't any of that. He sat there and he asked me a series of questions, three or four questions. As I answered the questions, he thought more. He asked another question, curiosity. And then at some point along the way, he realized he had a connection. He knew this guy, Vito, at Shea Stadium, and he knew he's got this kid over here that's never going to get in. And he decided to connect us together. And he didn't have to do any of this stuff. Mm. So he does that. So I leave. I have this amazing experience. The crazy thing is, just like the Seth Godin story, that was 30-something years ago. Funzie has no idea that it ever happened. He has no idea the impact of what he did for my life. And in so many ways, he taught me curiosity is the king. He taught me to take chances. For my, there was so many things I learned from 10 minutes from a guy that wasn't even my teacher. He was a better teacher for me in high school because I was during high school than all of my teachers in high school. Mm. And so the, so the idea of curiosity came from that. Like when you ask questions, you control the conversation. You find out what's going on. You learn about other people and then you can open doors for them. And then when you do that, they might talk about you for the rest of their life, no matter when you died. So to me, that's the power of curiosity.